hari bersubuh. Tonight on First at Nine this Tuesday, the 5th of December 2023. PTA tensions. Parliament heats up as MPs discuss the Prevention of Terrorism Act with Tamil MPs accusing the government of racial misuse. Education reform. Education Minister presents sweeping education reforms in Parliament, including the early culmination of school life. Artsy artifacts. Returned Lankan artifacts go on exhibition at the National Museum today after 200 years of Dutch custody. Dutch envoy comments on further cultural cooperation between both nations. Barcode babies. Sri Lanka issues its first ever digital birth certificate that will seamlessly translate into an ID number upon eligibility. Obey Vishwasi Dino Sinsudain, then Lakamati Pharmacy in Labak at the Hacker. This is Ada Verna First at Nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and a warm welcome to you to Adhidharana's English News. First at nine, I'm Jonathan Benedict. Let's take a look at our news stories for the day, starting with our top story right now. Drama, drama, drama. Parliament took a tense turn today as Tamil parliamentarians accused the government for using the Prevention of Terrorism Act against Tamils. Parliamentarians Gajendran Ponambalam said that the government was trying to portray Tamils as terrorists, while MP Rasamanikam accused the government for adhering to double standards before the international community. However, denying those claims, parliamentarian of Sri Lanka Podujana Peruman Premnath Dolavatta said that stern action will be taken against people who are involved in terrorism-related activity, irrespective of their ethnicity. Honorable State Minister of Foreign Affairs, it's important to note that if you follow the tweets of the last week on Twitter, Ambassador Julie Chang from the US Embassy has tweeted about the use of the PTA. High Commissioner Andrew Patrick from the British High Commission has tweeted about the use of the PTA. The European Union in Sri Lanka has tweeted about the use of the PTA, just like how they did in the last year with the rest relating to the protest. The European Union in Sri Lanka have tweeted. The Embassy for Canada in Sri Lanka and Maldives has tweeted. And the UN Human Rights Twitter account has also tweeted. Now, this is a very serious issue, Honorable state minister in charge of foreign affairs because you are telling the international community one thing and within the country you are doing the exact opposite. There is no reconciliation in this country. Right now, the number of people who are migrating, the number of people who are leaving this country and seeking asylum in foreign countries has increased. That is because they can't live with this, within this country. Either they are arrested under the PTA for memorialization, there were no LTT flags, there were no symbols relating to the LTT in Batiklo, but they were arrested. There was a young boy who was 18 years old. He's a school student. The only thing that he did was he accompanied his father who, who provided equipment for that event. He's been arrested and detained. The school has given a letter. Now, how do you expect the Tamils to live in this country and how do you expect us to believe that the government is genuine in its reconciliation efforts? For commemoration, you're using the PTA despite the fact that you have said to the world that there is a moratorium on the usage of the PTA and when simply for commemorating, when you could use whatever other legal measures that you want to investigate, you use the PTA primarily because you want to terrorize the population. You want to terrorize them to make sure that you give up effectively commemorations because your intention is not reconciliation. Your intention is not to allow people to have their right. On the contrary, you want to make sure that it is breached in such a way that on the next occasion those people themselves will censor their own activities and not commemorate. Unfortunately, we are raising the racism in this house. We do not care about whatever the commemoration, what Whatever using in North and East to memorize whoever dead in this civil war, the war. But unfortunately, we have we can't just let go our PT Act in this country. Any country has a prevention law on terrorism. So we have to have that. We just can't just get away from the PTA and have the liberty to do anything for any terrorism activity. So we have to have even so-called democratic country as USA. They have their patriotic act. So we must be very careful on what we are asking. 
for instance, uh, there are incidents in Colombo, in Southern, there are some suspects who arrested under PTA. We know that PTA might be using, in a, in a wrong way, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't object, I didn't, I didn't disturb, you know, I have only three minutes. What is this? Behave like a gentleman. Just wait. This is a one country. No, North and East is not a, another part of the country. We have to understand the real situation. This is not entire, it is Tamil people. Tamil people also have a brotherhood. They are also citizens of this country. Tamil law, single law, Muslim. If somebody has violated their rights under PTA, we are against on that. Definitely, we don't have any differences among these because of the ethnicity. The short answer for your question is no, certainly not. We don't want to hoodwink anybody. Once uh, when Mr. Uh, Ranil Vikram Singh became president of the uh, country last year, through the parliament, through the uh, constitution, the need of the hour was for the economic reforms. Not only did Mr. Uh, Ranil Vikram Singh uh, embarked on uh, economic reforms, but he also spoke of political reforms, progress. And similarly, we do accept and understand that the root causes of the war in Sri Lanka also has to be addressed. So there's no contention in that regard. But I tell you that why uh, Honorable His Excellency the Ranil Vikram Singh uh, or the government does not want to uh, suppress his uh, citizens. So when Ranil Vikram Singh became president, he not only spoke of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, which he started, and also the OC Sri Lankan's office, and he expedited the work of the uh, OMP, and also the uh, reparations in the, uh, the National Unity and Reconciliation uh, Council was also uh, expedited. And most importantly, he invited all the representatives in this parliament for a meeting to see what form of devolution we can embark on. I think we need to meet, reach an agreement and we need to move forward. I think we also need to stop building this narrative, that this narrative saying that, you know, this narrative that the government is, signed, is trying to suppress the oh, Tamil Nadu government and because of that the, the Tamils are leaving the country. If you look, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker, even the Sinhalese are leaving the country. That's because of the economic conditions in the country. Uh, uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, there are other reasons why the people are leaving, but we are, you're not talking about that. You're only talking about one aspect of that. In a paradigm shift development, the Ministry of Education has proposed new education reforms, including the conclusion of primary school education by age 17, whilst enabling the commencement of preschool education at the age of four years, begging the question, where was this blessing when I was schooling? Through the new education reforms, opportunities have been provided to children who, who sit the ordinary level exams to study vocational training courses as it further enables them to obtain degrees in voc vocational fields of study. The progress of the 2023 year and plans for the 2024 year regarding the budget of the Ministry of Education were recently presented in Parliament by the Minister of Education, Dr. Susil Premajayantha. According to the new education reforms, the conclusion of primary school education at age 17 was proposed, with preschool education to commence at four years of age. Grades 1 to 5 will henceforth be classified as primary school, grades 6 to 8 as the junior section, and grades 9 to 12 as the senior section. It has also been proposed that the grade 5 scholarship exam be simplified with the reduction of unnecessary complexities. Concurrently, the proposed new education reforms also make it mandatory to conduct the ordinary level exam in grade 10 as opposed to grade 11 previously, while the advanced level examination will be held in grade 12 as opposed to grade 13 previously. The Ministry of Education further added that the number of school subjects will be reduced from 9 to 7 subjects, with a further proposal to make it mandatory to study three new subjects, namely information and communication technology, technical and professional skills, and religious values under this reform. In the meantime, opportunities were provided to children who sat the ordinary level exams to engage in vocational training courses, while the proposed new educational reforms further enabled them to obtain degrees in vocational fields. An exhibition themed Lost Heritage Reclaimed to showcase Sri Lankan artifacts which were returned to Sri Lanka from the Netherlands opened to the public this morning. This exhibition will be held until further notice. Ambassador for International Cultural Cooperation at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Davy van der Werd, highlighted the importance for strengthening cultural cooperation with Sri Lanka. Speaking to other than English news, she said that measures are underway to return more Sri Lankan artifacts that are in the Netherlands in the future. On the 29th of November, six Sri Lankan artifacts looted by the Dutch during the colonial era were physically returned to the island at the Bandaranaika International Airport in Katunaika. These artifacts that were under the custody of the Dutch for over 200 years included Luke Tisava's cannon, a ceremonial sword and a Sinhalese knife. Following the arrival of these artifacts, they were safely transported to the National Museum in Colombo. This morning, an exhibition themed Lost Heritage Reclaimed, organized by the Ministry of Buddha Sasana and the Cultural Affairs National Museum Department to showcase these six artifacts to the public commenced at the National Museum in Colombo. The event was attended by President's Chief of Staff Sagala Ratnayaka, Minister of Buddha Sasana and Cultural Affairs Vidura Vikramanayaka, 
Ambassador for International Cultural Cooperation at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Davy Wenderwerd, and Dutch Ambassador in Colombo, Bonnie Horbeck. According to the President's Media Division, these artifacts will be on public display at the museum from today until further notice. According to Lord Buddha, no matter you win thousands of battles, if you cannot win over yourself, you may not see the light. The government of Netherlands has seen the light, which has been looted from Sri Lanka three centuries ago, has been returned to Sri Lanka. You need a lot of guts to do that. The other countries are still thinking of it. We really appreciate and admire the courage you had to return these objects back to us. This is our pride. We have to build upon this, not only the country, but also to foster and strengthen the relations between Netherlands and Sri Lanka. Restitution is about repairing historical injustice and strengthening these bonds. The importance of restitution of colonial objects hinges on two principles. Firstly, it entails the recognition of past historical injustices, injustices that were done to the indigenous population of colonial territories, when cultural heritage objects were taken against their will. Injustices that will continue as long as these objects remain in the possession of Dutch museums against the will of countries of their of origin. Secondly, it entails our readiness to rectify these historical injustices. This is a key principle of our Dutch policy on dealing with colonial collections now. And it is an acknowledgement that the appropriation of many cultural, historical and religious objects looted from colonial territories and the display of these in Dutch museums as if belonging to the Dutch can no longer hold. Meanwhile, speaking to other Derana's English news, the Ambassador for International Cultural Cooperation at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Davy Wenderwerd, commented on the level of cultural support the Netherlands can extend to Sri Lanka. What more measures will be initiated by the Dutch government in order to improve cultural ties with Sri Lanka? So we have a very good cooperation uh, where we share expertise, for example, on our international heritage. There are different heritage objects also in Sri Lanka, but also there are churches, there are different buildings uh, that we have also been been cooperating together in the past, so we intend to continue to do so. But we also think that there is a possibility to continue provenance research on other objects, to share museum expertise, and to also have, for example, universities work together, and museums um, are also going to continue to see what kind of things they can do together, for example, also in the field of having debates about this process. Are there any projects to be initiated in the near future in terms of building cultural cooperation? Yes, our embassy of the Netherlands here in Sri Lanka is very active and they have a lot of plans already lined up. So they are intending to do a series of talks. They are also actually working in other fields, so not only in heritage, but also in dance, in design. So there is many other sectors, contemporary art, that we uh, are planning to work in. At the same time, the Sri Lankan government is looking at promoting tourism and cultural tourism is one of the main aspects. How can the Dutch support in this? We as countries are all facing the same issues uh, where we have monuments of a bygone era and we still want to keep them interesting for a public to visit because it is good for tourism and it is also to the interest of the general public. So we are really interested in sharing expertise with uh, Sri Lanka on these issues and you see that also the Sri Lankan side has uh, a lot of experience where we can learn from and the Dutch experts are also intending uh, to come to Sri Lanka in the future to work together on this. So we will do courses, uh, we will do the missions, uh, we will have trainings together. Things like that is what we plan to do. And at the same time, are there more artifacts of Sri Lanka and are there any plans to return those artifacts back to Sri Lanka? Yes, there are more artifacts from Sri Lanka in the Netherlands and what we plan to do is to continue our provenance research on these objects together with Sri Lanka. It is up to the Sri Lankan government to decide which objects they would like to see returned. But we intend to work together so that we can at least research the provenance of the different objects and we can also share those researches amongst academia, amongst the universities and also the museums museums intend to continue to work together. Under the purview of the e-population program, Sri Lanka issued its first digitized national birth certificate with a barcode today. Imagine being born here with your very own barcode. The e-population is introduced to achieve objectives of issuing a unique personal identification number at birth for all citizens. Under this initiative, per international standards, the number included in this national birth certificate will be converted into national identity card numbers later.
We can chalk one up your efficiency here. The expectation is to build a consolidated matrix of basic information for every Sri Lankan citizen and create an efficient and reliable life events registration system, increasing information sharing with government institutions using the population register. It aims to provide more extensive and analytic, analytical capability in relation to demographics and health statistics and an increase in coverage of recording life events. Addressing the event held in Kalutara District Secretariat this morning, State Minister of Home Affairs Ashoka Priyantha said that the initiative is expected to be expanded beyond Kalutara to other districts in the coming future. Welcome back. A protest was staged by the Teachers and Principals Trade Union this afternoon, demanding that all allocations made for immediately for the development of the education sector, with a further demand that their issues be resolved promptly. The protest was ceremoniously staged during the budget debate relevant to the Education Ministry, which was simultaneously being deliberated in Parliament. The Teachers and Principals Trade Union staged a protest at the Parliament roundabout this afternoon. The police handed the protesters an order obtained from the Colombo Magistrates Court to refrain from conducting the protest to cause distress among the general public. As such, the court order had been addressed to eight respondents, including the General Secretary of the Ceylon Teachers Union, Joseph Stalin, and the General Secretary of the Ceylon Teachers Service Union, Mahinda Jayasinghe. <laughs> The protest was coincidentally staged while the budget relevant to the Education Ministry was being debated in Parliament today. Riot police eventually had to be deployed to ease the traffic congestion which arose as a result of the protest this afternoon. A technical failure in one of the water cannon trucks dispatched on site compounded the crowd control measures. The protesters eventually dispersed after making their stand near the Poldua junction in Batramulla. The Sri Lankan Air Force officially received two Harbin Y-12-4 twin-engine turboprop utility aircrafts in a ceremony at Rathmalana Airport today. I dare you to repeat that. Air Force Commander Air Marshal Udeni Rajapaksha said that these crafts will be used in maritime operations in the Indian Ocean in the future. The commander further stated that it will also be incorporated in the heli tourism services operated under the purview of the Sri Lankan Air Force in the coming future. Sri Lanka Air Force officially received two Harbin Y-12s, a twin-engine light multi-role aircraft developed by Harbin Aircraft Manufacturing Corporation in China today. These aircraft serve various purposes, including passenger and cargo transportation, search and rescue, and surveillance operations. The Y-12 started joining the Sri Lanka Air Force fleet in 1987 with the acquisition of Y-12-2 variant, and in 1996, the number 8 tactical transport squadron was established with the 9 Y-12-2 aircraft becoming the backbone of fixed-wing light transport fleet of the Sri Lanka Air Force. In 2009, Y-12-4 variant was acquired, enhancing the tactical transport capabilities of the Sri Lanka Air Force. These Y-12s have accrued over 67,500 flying hours and played major roles in passengers and cargo transport, VVAP and VIP flights, airborne operations, surveillance and reconnaissance, search and rescue, CASIVAC and also MEDIVAC operations in Sri Lanka. Interestingly, Y-12 fleet initiated the cloud seeding operations in Sri Lanka for the first time in the history. These two Harbin Y-12-4 aircraft will be the latest addition to the Sri Lanka Air Force tactical transport fleet under the current air power augmentation program. Similar to the Dornier induction, these 
will enhance the surveillance and reconnaissance operations to advance maritime domain awareness in the Indian Ocean region. Furthermore, these two platforms are earmarked to revitalize the passenger transport services under the heli tours operations of the Sri Lanka Air Force. This is one of the primary initiatives of the Sri Lanka Air Force that underpins tourism promotion to support the national economic development policies of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka Air Force is grateful to our regional nations such as India for the Donia program supplementing the capabilities of augmentation in the maritime domain and China for their continuous assistance right throughout. Further, we are also welcoming our global partners such as USA and Australia for coming on board for air power advancement in the maritime domain awareness through the planned Beechcraft induction programs that are to realize in the very near future. Moving into business news, economic experts of the view that the current decision of the government to increase value-added tax is of far superior rationale than increasing the CES tax or para-tariffs given the situation in order to increase government tax revenue. Following the increase, economists expect an increase of 7 to 8% increase in retail prices of consumer goods in the coming year, which will create a contraction in consumption. So if you have a diet planned starting 2024, chances are you probably have no choice. To further expand this thought, we have Murtaza Jafaji, Chairman of the Advocata Institute, in our next segment, Understanding Taxes in Sri Lanka. The VAT is the best form of indirect tax, unlike the, the social security levy, which is 2.5%, which is a cascading tax, and para tariffs like CES and PAL, which are highly distortionary. The reason why VAT is a better form of taxation is any enterprise only pays for the value addition that it adds, and you have the benefit of input credit for taxes, somebody down the supply chain who have paid it before. Since the government was lagging in tax collection, they settled that increasing the VAT, which is much better than taking up the social security levy from 2.5% to 4%. The other major change is base widening. There are a large number of exemptions on VAT and what they have done is besides education and healthcare and a few food items, VAT will be applicable for most items. The Treasury Secretary has clarified that electricity, kerosene and naphtha, there will be no VAT. Final decision on petrol and diesel will be made closer to January when most of the VAT is going to come into force. So just to give you an example, a supermarket a CEO told me that at the moment 50% of his revenues have VAT. From 1st January it will become 75%. Now items on which there was no VAT don't necessarily have to increase by 18% because there would have been VAT on inputs to many of the firms which they could pass on. So realistically it will be more like 7 to 8% increase increase in retail prices. This is going to be an impact for many households. The items on which VAT is going to come in for 1st January are not necessarily discretionary, they're more staple items. But there are items like mobile phones and, and electronic items on which there was no VAT and it has been extended, which shouldn't be of concern to most people because it is the same all over the world. And businesses who have to pay this, they can anyway claim the input credit. So it is going to contract demand that consumption due to affordability is going to come down but at the same time large saving that was happening from the state which brought about the instability would reduce because this is an easier form of tax to collect so again 2024 will be a year of stabilization and recovery and hopefully thereafter that if the policies don't change uh, we will be able to post three to four percent growth which will increase the incomes for most households Minister of Tourism Harin Fernando says that Sri Lanka expects 2.4 million tourists in 2024, almost doubling the tourist arrivals recorded in 2023. Joining an event to promote tourism in Sri Lanka, Minister Fernando said that he expects to drive more investment into Sri Lanka and more youth-based initiatives in the tourism sector through his current portfolios of ministries which includes lands and youth affairs. 33% of our travelers are repeaters. I think that was one of the biggest trigger points for us to say you'll come back for more. All of us have to play a role 
to get people to come back to visit Sri Lanka. If Sri Lanka is going to be a bucket list country, we're not going to succeed. We need to spread the word. And I think Sri Lanka has much more to offer than what people know about Sri Lanka. It's not just Marisa, it's not just the beach, it's not just Sigiriya, it's not just Nuareli, it's not just Kandy, but there's much, much more to go deep into Sri Lanka. As one said, we are a resilient nation. 15 months ago, none of this could have been possible. None of us would have seen ourselves walking into 1.5 million tourists end of this year. Next year, 2024, we are quite hopeful of reaching 2.5 million. Now that I actually have the youth affairs also, we're looking at empowering youth a lot, coming to tourism, making new homestays, making new initiatives to promote tourism. And that's a super network that I actually have it under my belt, so which we can collaborate and work together to promote tourism. I have lands too, and that's another area where we can really promote investment into Sri Lanka and to have the next level of tourism brought into Sri Lanka. So I'm quite excited. Our governments are only there to facilitate. We are not here to do business. It is up to the industry to be innovative, to come up with new, fresh thoughts, ideas, face the challenges. We will be there to help you. This is a development that has taken place over the last three to four years. And it's thanks to the European Union and USA that we were able to come up with this product. This is a product that won an award at WTM this year, competing with many countries, which is an achievement for Sri Lanka. It is a trail that spans over 300 kilometers, starting from Kandy and ending up at Vidur Talagala via Alla and getting back to the Nuralia region. Well, it has 22 stops and a lot of hard work has gone into it. And this is only a start. And as we go along, there will be many more new products being introduced to the Sri Lanka the Colombo Stock Exchange ended lower today, dragged down by losses in industrial and financial stocks. The CSE All Share Price Index settled down 0.4% at 10,700 10, points, snapping four straight sessions of gains, while the S&P SL20 was down 0.43% at 3,054.41 points. SoftLogic Holdings PLC and LOLC Finance PLC were the top losers on the CSE All Share Index, falling 41.51% and 4.17% respectively. Trading volume on the CSE All Share Index rose to 31.8 million shares from 21.9 million shares in the previous session. Equity market turnover rose to 711.2 million shares, million rupees, pardon me, from 708.4 million rupees in the previous session. The capital goods sector was the top contributor to market turnover today, while the food, beverage and tobacco sector was the second highest contributor. Foreign investors were net buyers purchasing stocks worth 150.4 million rupees, while domestic investors were net sellers offloading shares worth 649.1 million rupees. With that, let's have a look at how the rupee traded against other major currencies as the day progressed. The Colombo Stock Exchange, in collaboration with the Global Reporting Initiative, officially launched the third version of the Sustainability Reporting Guide today. The goal of this initiative is to foster sustainability reporting between listed companies on the exchange. With that, let's take a look at some other corporate news from the corporate sector today. The Colombo Stock Exchange, in collaboration with the Global Reporting Initiative, has developed the third version of the Sustainability Reporting Guide, which was ceremoniously launched at the market opening bell ringing ceremony today. CSE Chairman Dilshan Virasekara, speaking at the event, said that the initiative was aimed at fostering sustainability reporting among the listed companies. Parallel to this, the CSE, in collaboration with GRI South Asia, also organized an informative knowledge session focused on corporate sustainability reporting in Sri Lanka for the representatives of listed companies. This session aims to provide an outline of existing standards and valuable insights into the latest developments in standards, offering a comprehensive overview. 
Group M, a leading media investment management company, has won two silver awards at the Campaign's Agency of the Year Awards for the year 2023. The Campaign's Agency of the Year Awards acknowledges inspirational leadership, managerial excellence, exceptional business performance and overall accomplishments in the realms of advertising and brands communications. Group M's agency brands Mindshare and Wavemaker earned a silver award in Rest of South Asia Digital Agency of the Year and Rest of South Asia Media Agency of the Year categories. In other news, the Sri Lanka Association of Non-State Higher Education Institutes hosted the National Higher Education Conference, focusing on the significant contribution by transnational education to higher education in Sri Lanka recently at Colombo. The conference was a full-day program facilitating peer-to-peer -peer exchange, networking and collaboration. The aim of the conference was to present key contributions made by transnational education to higher education in Sri Lanka, to bring together all stakeholders of TNE education, academics and scholars from key TNE partner universities, to promote a robust and inclusive quality assurance and accreditation mechanism in Sri Lanka. <clears throat> Sri Lanka will get approximately 600 million US dollars on a staggered basis from the Asian Development Bank after the International Monetary Fund releases the second tranche of a 2.9 billion US dollar bailout for the crisis hit country. ADB Sri Lanka Country Director Takafumi Kodono told Reuters that alongside the IMF program, the Asian Development Bank is likely to provide total budget support amounting to $2 billion over the next four years. He said $500 million US dollars to $600 million US dollars budget support is what is planned for 2024. However, again, it is subject to attainment, satisfying the policy actions, so it's not free money. He said that the first installment of the 200 million US dollars is tabled for ADB's board support on the 8th of December, but will only be given to Sri Lanka after IMF approves its first review on the 2nd of on the 12th of December. Pardon me. Another 200 million US dollars for power sector reforms is expected in 2024, along with 100 million US dollars to the water sector and 50 million US dollars to 70 million US dollars for the tourism sector. An additional 100 million US dollars is earmarked in ADB support to improve access to financing for small and medium sized enterprises, along with another 100 million US dollars to improve public finance and debt management. That's all the news I have for you for now. I'm Jonathan Benedict. Have a blessed Wednesday and a good night.